Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome onto the stage, Will Hodgson. I didn't think it could be done. We fitted F1 in. We fitted F1 in, haven't we? We fitted them in. I told you we could do it. it. I said it could be done. They said it couldn't be done. Where's Robin, who said it couldn't be done on Facebook? Has he got a seat? Is he here and seated? He may well be the, the man, the doomsayer, the man who said it couldn't be done, that we couldn't fit F1 in, is the only one who's not got a seat. So that's some sort of... <laughs> Cormic retribution there for the naysayer. Um, this is brilliant. Welcome to Chippenham. Welcome to the Three Cranes. What from my actual local, which is about how many doors up do I, do I live from this, Gemma? We live from this. About what ten doors up from from this? Yeah, this is the closest gig to home I've ever done, and this is this is my tenth birthday as a comedian. It's a ten years ago today that I first come to Jester's in Bristol and did a very unsuccessful open spot. And <laughs> then when well, I come back on the day after and did a, it was even worse on the, on the day after actually. A lot to do the whole thing. Mitch Ben sat down with me beforehand, went through my material and yeah, I tanked just the same as when he hadn't gone through the material. It was, there was no help in the material <laughs> essentially at all. And yeah, and then he's got these, so it's been, it's been 10 years now and yeah it's just it's kind of full circle for me right back where I started it feels really good to be in here it's a proper pub this is like this is my actual local it's, it's a lot of stand up DVDs are supposed to be recorded in arenas now in lots sort of big like air hangar type places and that this, this is where alternative comedy come from it come from pubs like this in the beginning with sort of beards like the one that I'm cultivating leading the leading the, I'm still unsure about the beard I'd never grown a beard before I thought I'd just sort of try and grow one over Christmas not like a sort of unkent whimsy beard but like a sort of Neil before Zod sort of super villains beard but it's not I'm, not, I'm, still uns, I'm still unsold about it. I thought, I, just, I thought my girlfriend will hate it and I'll have to shave it off. No, she likes it, unfortunately. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm, st I'm stuck with this growing out of my foot. I'm past the itchy stage. What I need is some wax. Later on, it will go, it'll be full on sort of... Remember Will Flunn? The guy, I sound like fucking Peter Kay here. The guy off a vision on with a big wax tash. Then that will be something. But this is beard in progress <laughs> as, we, as we stand here. Now, who's not from Chippenham? Who's come here from further afield? By show, by show, by show of hands, all but. <laughs> who's from Chip? Who's from Chippenham? In here, it's a fully Chippenham, fully Chippenham. Turn it. I've just gone. I'm kind of go. I'm kind of sort of like circling around, circling around it. Cause I just, I just can't believe we pulled it off. I really didn't think we'd be able to, we'd be able to do this. This in here, this in here. That it's, it's just fucking. Give yourselves a round of applause for making it happen. Everyone's. <laughs> GFS and the pub, the punters. We did it. We did it. Now, I've got, um, also, I've managed to personalise this corner <laughs> somewhat with some others. See, I, can, I don't mind transporting my collection just a little bit down the road. I was worried about, about melting is one of the big fears of the My Little Pony collector, that things all sort of dissolve. Because the, the big roar, the fire's not as roaring now as it was. That was roaring away nicely when we were same check. And I was quite worried about getting, because I was originally going to stand right in front of the fire. And I thought that's just a sure recipe for basically unintentionally nicking one of Oliver Hardy's great comedy routines and sort of standing there talking about like Care Bears or Skinheads, whatever. And he's sort of like, you know, in like old films, someone's ass catches fire. They're not, they're not immediately. <laughs> They're not immediately in pain. They just sort of go like, <laughs> I can smell, I can smell bird. And they turn around. When they actually see their asses on fire, then they suddenly experience the pain. So what we've got is an emergency, tr like a trough and some snow outside. So if that happens, I can like run over, sit in it, steam, or come out of it and I'll like go like, <laughs> in a relief way and not, and not spend 10 months in hospital with severe burns to my buttocks and the backs of my legs like would have happened to Oliver Hardy in every single thing. He'd have been maimed for a life. One of the three stooges died, didn't he, from constantly getting battered on the head by the cold of the basin cut. I think that's a true story. Um, that might, that might not be in the DVD if it's not, because otherwise I'm accusing... <laughs> Others are accusing the guy of the Free Stooges of a terrible crime of 
prolonged murder of someone. I think it actually happened. The other guy, the guy who replaced him, had it written into his contract that he wasn't supposed to hit him too hard and go nyuk, 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 and like hit him with a claw hammer <laughs> over the top of the head. But yeah, intro, there'll be a lot of that tonight. If you've seen me before, there'll be lots of pointless trivia about so there's some of it's like that's true some of it's dubious some of it i've heard in pubs and some of it i just make up to see if people will believe it so you'll have to just get on you have to just remember it and get on the old wikipedia and check out but sometimes i've been at that as well so <laughs> so you never know you never know it's a very small part it's a very small part of my collection these are the four, four of the well, it's pretty much it's, it's four Earth ponies and one second generation pony, as any collector will know. This is this is serious business to me, collecting. So what, me and my girlfriend, Gemma, who's at the back there, we live in a small flat on top of a hair salon just up the just up the road, and it's got. It's, see, when I was single, it was the greatest place in the world for me. I was about 22 years old, I'd left university and I was just pretty much just used to get stoned and I was attempting to be an all-in wrestler at the time in Trowbridge. So it was, I wasn't leading a life of responsibility at the time. I'd come out of loot. It was basically drugs and getting hit over the head with chairs and smashed into the ring and letting 30 stone men sit on your face. Seems, seems like a good option. Anything to make you forget you ever set foot in Luton will do the trick. It's all... <laughs> It's either that or legitimate self-harming. So, I, was, I, I mean, it used to be great. So I used to have all my collection in there. I just used to sit there, me and my mates, and sit and like watch videos like the 1960s Spider-Man cartoon where they've just like superimposed him over the top of other cartoons because they've run out of budget. And he's like on the top of Rocket Robin Hood or something. So Spider-Man's fighting medieval dragons and that. We just sort of sit there. And it was great. I had all this... I had all this it's not just My Little Ponies. That's just the tip of the iceberg with my collection. There's all kinds of records, comics, um, all kinds of stuff, different kinds of toys as well, not just My Little Ponies, there's Keepers and all of that. That's where, that's where you that's where you used to keep the tote back in the back. I don't smoke draw anymore. I got pulled over by a drug-sniffing poodle two days ago. I was at Swindon train station. I was going to a gig and I was dressed pretty much, I had a white Ben Sherman and Dr. Martin's jeans with turnips and an MA1 flight jacket on. And there's this, like, this poodle thing with a railway cop and it was sniffing people's legs. It got right up my leg and I got sort of dragged out. And it was quite, sort of, you, you forget that you sort of like, part of you sort of like, shit, shit, a bit, a bit, but you sort of think, no, it's, you, you forget you've got nothing to worry about. And I haven't for quite some time. I've not had a smoke for you. I used to smoke a, a lot. I used to smoke so much that I, I actually thought Jamiroquai were a good band at one point. <laughs> You get to that sort of so it's, it ruins your like your, your credibility and your record collection, your personal hygiene more than more than anything. But um, <laughs> it's really weird that because it's sort of like I, was, I can I, can, I, it's, I don't know it's it's the the poodle as well. They must have given the rail cops the most rubbish drug dog that they had because you can imagine they sort of let's give the rail cops something to do today. Let's let them find a guy with like one spliff in his pocket and do nothing about it so they feel like they're in a position of power. Like, oh, that's a bloody suit us fine. So the rail cops, great. Can we have the big Alsatian? No, no, you're not having the Alsatian. That's our Alsatian for like big heroin busts and that. You have the ratty little poodle thing. It's probably, probably just smelt my cat. It's not on, <laughs> it's not on, no, it's just a very bad drug dog. But um, they didn't check him to turn up some of my jeans or anything like that. It was just a very bad search attack. So, I mean, my, my granddad was a, was a copper. He was a detective, in fact, in the, in like the, about the 1950s to the 1970s. And he's, uh, he's, I, I've, he's a big influence on me in many ways in my life. He's the most amazing man I've ever known. He was a collector of things as well. He just collects loads of really weird stuff. He's got just odd stuff around the house. He used to have a bloke's ear in a jar in the garage in like a jar of formaldehyde it was it was unclaimed after there was some kind of like teddy boy fight at like the, <laughs> at like the Bristol beer keller or something they sort of slashed each other up and by the time they sort of took everyone away and hung them to be proved innocent 40 years down the line or whatever they, they said the forensic guys were like it was an ear if you want if you want it can uh, and he said if you, so if you get like 90 years old you forget what you did with your life you can go in the garage and look at the severed ear and go oh, it must have been in the police service at some point I mean <laughs> In my life, uh, that was, a, it was the freakiest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was like a fucking mushroom in a, in a jar, and it was in the garage, and my great-grandmother's ashes were in like a little sort of tea tin next to it with a picture of Lord Kitchener on it. He used to have a squashed mouse marking a page in a book. <laughs> it is in like his room where he's got the big bookshelf in it. It's not a study, he's got a big bookshelf in there and a, and a spare bed. But he's, he's used to... 
he's told me amazing stories. I can't really tell any of them because of the, just because of like, un, not unreliability, but like, do you know what I mean? It's the days of police when there was no red tape. And he was telling me what's, what I used to drink in the bar now and then. He said he used to go in there undercover in the 60s when they were trying to like bust sort of hippie LSD printing presses and stuff. Apparently the bear allegedly, for the benefit of the legal department, the DVD, he used to be absolutely rife with it. And he was, he was about, my granddad was about, what, sort of 45 years old at the time. And he used to have this sidekick called, I can't remember his name, but he used to be huge. Even as like an 80-something year old man when I was a kid, he was this terrifying vision. He wouldn't have fit through that fucking door at the back there he was like sort of joe Wass's face out of reservoir dogs you know the bloke they say looks like the thing uh, he looked like someone who looks like someone else <laughs> but ultimately to borrow quentin tarantino's analogy he looked like the thing ben Grimm, out of the fantastic four and they went undercover in the bear in the 60s him and his mate they disguised as what they thought hippies looked like what two 45 year old blokes thought a hippie <laughs> might entail so they got like Hawaiian shirts and sandals and like wigs, women's wigs, like sort of borrowed from a like a local wig shop or something, and like straw hats, and they went in the in the bear looking for hippies. So apparently they went in. Apparently my granddad's mate, he'd been told by his doctor because he'd had like he'd have an heart trouble, like angina and stuff, and they said to him, "You got to stop drinking beer." This is your main problem. Said so if you drank wine then you'd be all right. It's better for your heart. If you're going to drink, you enjoy your drink. I can't tell you not to drink. And that just just have some wine when you're in the pub. You'll be absolutely fine. So they get to the bar, and my granddad goes, like, I'll have a pint of uh, mild or whatever the fuck people used to drink back then. And he go, they go, fine. And he go, his, his mate goes, I'll have a wine. And they go, like, red wine. Because red wine's fine. The bloke gets the glass out. And he goes, what the fuck are you doing with that little glass? He goes, uh, glass. He goes, I want a fucking pint of wine. <laughs> And he goes, but wine cut don't come. And he gets his warrant card. He goes, I'll fucking shut you down if you don't get me a pint of wine. I get to it. No, this instant, he gets him a pint of wine. And my granddad's having a sort of sniff round looking for anyone who's talking about, like, Pink Floyd or, or some such. And, <laughs> and this boar maid comes up to him. He's got, like, a massive sort of purple stain all down the front of her top and, like, her cleavage and that. And she goes, are you old Bill? And he's like, well, what makes you say that? Oh dear, and she takes him upstairs, and his, his mates got drunk ten fucking pints of red wine <laughs> and bagged off with a poor mate and a lot of vomit all over himself, all over her, all over the sort of bottom. That was the days of fucking policing. <laughs> That was, that was the days of pubs, the days of police, and that was the good old the good old days of something. But my mum collects as well. She collects Wizard of Oz and Star Wars stuff, and, and I, I just I've always collected loads of stuff. Now. It's fine when you're on your own, but when you start to cohabit, when you, when you collect loads of stuff, you don't really envision yourself living with a woman ever. Do you know what I mean? You just presume this is never going to happen. You think to yourself as you polish your keepers and readjust your like 70s Marvel Comics mago action figures. You think it's not going to be on the cards, is it, at the end of the day? Probably going to die alone here, but never the mind. And... <laughs> Then it happened, I met Gemma, and when I met Gemma, she was about 18, 19 years old, I was about 25, and one of the things that we both liked at the time was the Spice Girls. Now, you've got to remember that Gemma would have been about 12, maybe, 12 years old at the time of the Spice Girls. I was 19 years old and a little wannabe skinhead at the time, so I was hardly really the target audience for the Spice Girls, so... <laughs> Gemma's got a better collection. See, I really do like the Spice Girls. Some people think I'm fucking about it. People say, what's your favourite band? I go the Sex Pistols and the Spice Girls. And they think I'm pissing about it. It's absolutely not. They're essentially the same fucking band, apart from the musical style. The Sex Pistols were the greatest boy band that was ever created. Anyone who says the, se the greatest... But everyone, who, anyone who says the Sex Pistols want a boy band is fucking deluding themselves. They're just a boy band with rotten teeth and criminal records, but a boy band nonetheless. The Spice Girls, see, the Spice Girls had that kind of... See, in terms of sexual fantasy, I'm very much a, like a social realist. I kind of... Think the Spice Girls just looked like girls that you got off with when you were younger, yourself, in your teenage years. They, they, they weren't supermodels. They got, like, you had Mel C. I mean, Mel B, right, would be 
the most conventional looking out of them as someone who's been pitched a sex symbol. But even then, when she opens her mouth, she sounds like Bernard Manning, doesn't she? <laughs> She's got sort of like, yeah, that kind of thing. Sort of very sort of earthy, quite sexy sort of voice. But it's kind of like Mel C. She had lots sort of odd teeth and that. I used to, I used to really do it for me. Emma Bunt and that was the... Anyone else would have looked... That would have been the dodgiest thing in the world, putting anyone else in those knee socks. Like, so Emma Bunt had the the proper sort of like essence it's just the body of someone who just sort of drinks and eats kebabs and I used to, I used to do it for her. just like a woman who looks like if you bought her dinner she'd eat it all <laughs> and go yeah I'll have, have a look at the dessert menu thing. <laughs> fair, enough, fair enough that's what I like to see you're not going to stick your arm halfway down your throat in the mm, refreshing and that and you know, Jerry Hallowell used to she had like this she looked like she should be mounted on the front of a fucking pirate ship back then she looks like a <laughs> She looks like a 10-year-old girl now with all that sort of... Like, she's all, like, sort of scrawny and, like, malnourished and stuff. She just used to look like every seaside postcard in the world, like, merged into... Well, into, it's just the sort of, the sort of real tits, you know what I mean? Not sort of, like, Zoo magazine pointy tits. Real tits, like, sort of gadunk like that. The sort of tits this country was built on that made... <laughs> the sort of tits that defeated Napoleon. Those sort of good old... British tits, and it's just, it was, they, they just sort of look the sort of girls who, when you were, I, know, I used to be in the Sea Cadets when I was when, when I was a kid, and the sort of girls that when you go down the Western Super Mare on like sort of courses and like the band and that, and you get shore leave, and you back when Western Super Mare had a pier, and boys in the southwest of England had. Adole an adolescence back then. That was it. Well, I don't know who burnt that pier, and I can't really speculate about that on DVD either. Because I don't want, I don't want someone knocking on my door and going, like, "So you got strong views on Western Supermare Pier burning down?" Have you had to advise you not to fucking have them if you know what's good for you? But it's just like when that pier burnt, they just burnt down. Just memories of just like I mean, it's just, there's no real sophisticated, polite way to say memories of titting up girls when you're like 13, 14 years old. But so it was. And you, there's, there's the girls that look like the Spice Girls that you go on the, you sort of like you go with your mates down there and you get TNT cider and little dynamite shaped bottles and you, you sort of pair up with some girls and there's a bit of sort of like brass strap pinging and lots sort of smoking and stuff and, and you sort of like cider drink and you sort of pair up and you sort of go down the other end of the pier and you're still at that stage where you're sort of asking girls if you can do things, you go like, can I suck your tits? And they go, don't mind. And... <laughs> You think, well, I will, and you, you're sucking a tit, and you sort of like, you sort of like, her head goes on your shoulder, and you sort of feel it moving. You think she's, you think she's fucking laughing at me. She's laughing. She finds my tit sucking ability <laughs> laughable because everyone must have sucked her tits apart from me for her to let a fucking loser like me do. You don't realise it's the nervous laughter of someone who's never had their tit sucked before, but you just sort of like, you just sit there and think, fuck, I might as well just jump off the end of Western Supermare Pier and let myself sink into the mud and wait for the tide, which will never, ever come. God, it's Western Supermare Sea Cadets. Western Supermare Sea Cadets with a fucking laughing stock. <laughs> They never won the row. By the time they got their boat out to the sea, it was time to, like, leave the sea cadets because you're 20 years old, time to join the fucking Royal Navy. <laughs> but you go, you see, you're there with a the gun, you sort of, like, she gives some of your cider and you sort of you finger her and she's eating chips while you're fingering her. And that, see, that's what the Spice Girls was all about. <laughs> That's what pop music should be about. Pop music should invoke that. If you don't sort of, if you don't look at it and think a lot of fairgrounds and chips and tits and cider and menthol cigarettes and that, then it's not a real fucking pop group. <laughs> Pete Waterman knows this. <laughs> Simon Cowell possibly does not. But anyway, so <clears throat> I already did. I used to collect as much Spice School stuff as I could. Though. I used to have the deodorant back then. That was. Well, it was, it was, it was Easy, it's buying it, it's easy enough. It's wearing it. See, I used to uh, I used to work at Iceland back then, and one week I'd had enough of Iceland because my boss ordered me to pick some sellotape up off the floor, and I wouldn't do it. So I had like a bit of a hissy fit and went to a job agency, and they put me on the removal vans for a week. Now this never should have happened. Ever, I should never be in a job that involves manual lifting with real men with the skills of real men. I've got this, I've got my hands just sort of taper off. It's the tops of my arms, certainly the tops of the arms of a 32-year-old man. They sort of taper off into the arms of a teenage girl and the hands of a woman. They sort of got great hands for foreplay, not so good for carrying things and hitting people with. But. <laughs> 
such as it is. So I used to, back in my nail polish days, used to be able to get served in some good elite lesbian bars and all that, get your Pat Butcher jacket on and everything. Some, some girls have got some refreshing sex fantasies about Pam St. Clements. So I got... I used to think... <laughs> I used to think I fancy Pat Butcher. I don't fancy Pat Butcher. I just want to learn from Pat Butcher. I just got it in my head that Pat Butcher knows every single way you could possibly sexually gratify a woman that's ever been thought of and some that have never even been committed to paper. She'd be like the Mr. Miyagi of a woman's <laughs> pelvic region. And she could show you all this in her, in her earthy good humour when plenty of like, oh, you won't find the answer in the... I just... Like, I just want to be friends with Pam St. Clements, but, um, and this is exactly the way to go about it, is making aspersions <laughs> like that for a commercially released digital versatile disc. But so I, I, I just got on the removal of that with Spice Girls deodorant on, and I, I said, the more I'd lift, the more I'd sort of sweat. You, you can, it's amazing what you can lift, though, when you've got two blokes with you that will fucking kill you if you drop it. <laughs> you find that sort of like Bruce Banner kind of inner strength. And I was like, it's just like, I got on there, so what do you do, what do you do then? I'm like, um, so I'm at university and I do, I was doing a bit of part-time work. So I was just like, I'm not gonna fucking speak to you again, you scumbag. And thus it went on. I thought the more I'm lifting and sweating, the more these blokes are like, what's that smell? I know that smell. They were thinking to themselves, like, oh, my 12 year old daughter's bedroom smells of that musty, spicy, nonetheless, odor. I thought they'll, I thought they'll kill me. I thought the bloke who was out will come back and he'll go like a cup of tea and I'll be, um, yeah, just the two cups of tea because we killed the students. He was wearing spice school. You know, we buried him in your back. Oh, you're moving out anyway. I, I wouldn't worry about it. If it comes to court, the judge will be like, what's this spice girl's deodorant? removal van, you guys are fucking case dismissed, this never should have happened, I, ch I charged the employment agency with neglect for allowing this to happen, but um, anyway, see this was the cause of some, the Spice Girl thing was the cause of some initial tension when Gemma first moved in, because Gemma was, was I said to Gemma, I like the Spice Girls, she had a lot of the Spice Girls too, and she said, I've got loads of, loads of posters that I collected at the time from magazines that you wouldn't have been able to get away with buying in your flight jacket and boots and stuff, and she said, you can, you can have them if you want. I thought, that's a very nice gesture. I don't think she thought I was going to actually decorate the living room <laughs> of the flat with them, and she, she didn't like I thought, why don't you like it? Of course, what I'd done was, she's like 19, 20 years old, on the cusp of womanhood, moving out of her mum's house and moving in to in with a with a with a boyfriend, an older man, and that I basically turned the living room of her love nest into the bedroom she'd just vacated <laughs> at her mother's house. All Spice Girls posters and fucking teddy bears and dolls and stuff. And I'm surprised. It, I'm surprised. I didn't. I suppose I didn't get my ass kicked to the curb back then. To be honest, I've done quite well. But <laughs> see. I've kind of cooled down with... I don't really collect much stuff now, just mostly things you can sort of... Like books, CDs, sort of thing, vinyl, things you can sort of slot in. But I nearly give it up once, because I went to an auction down by the... Matt, you, went, you come with me to this auction. This was... I'm going to need you as a witness for, to corroborate the awesomeness of this collection. A basically, a bloke died in Cal, or some or something or another. He just dropped dead one day. And it was in the paper. Because my mum just... I'll get up in the morning, usually. My mum will have the Gazette on a Thursday. And I'll sort of come down, like, sort of, like, coffee? Yes, please. She'll get the paper and go, do you know this bloke, then? She'll push it towards me. Usually, it'll be somebody who's, like, bitten a copper's nose off. <laughs> at a taxi rank. Do you want to know if it was some nutter that I used to score off of or something? But... This time it was it wasn't it was this bloke in Cowan who died. So I don't know him, but he died leaving this amazing collection of film memorabilia. And having no family, they decided to auction it off down the auction house that's down the road from. Well, it's not actually a direct route through that door, but it's in that direction <laughs> down there, down St Mary Street. And I, I went went along and it's like Matt, Matt, you come out. This 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 was the was this not the greatest collection of stuff you ever seen in your in your life? Most comprehensive, most, most comprehensive. Right, basically, name a British, someone name a British film. A classic <laughs> British film. Carry on, Carry on Camping. He had every 
carry on film that you could from Sergeant right the way through to that shit one that with that was with Columbus and that weird one with Emmanuel where Kenneth Williams's ass is going up and down all the way through that he never should have signed on the line for. Everyone, the poster, the quad poster, the press kit, and the he had like autographs from he had written correspondence, he'd written to Kenneth Williams and got and got letters back from them. But they were basically like sort of dear bloke from Cowan, fucking leave me alone. I'm a much more <laughs> intense bloke than my film appearance to have you believe I fucking hate everyone I'm very unsure of my sexuality and hate myself fuck yourself yours sincerely Kenneth Williams Esquire and sort of Barbara Windsor had written him back and gone like and sort of gone like yes yeah, it's very, very nice and sort of privately phoned up someone to have, get Ronnie Knight to have him snuffed out or something it was <laughs> Everything, the Sweeney, the post of Sweeney 2, Get Carter, the Wicker Man. There was a big thing of a low, a low stuff in like a, in like a book, like a binder. I had all the postcards from a low, a low, signed photographs. I fucking love a low, a low. Me and Gemma watched an all nine series of it, didn't we? In bed over about a month. That, that, that policeman, that never gets tired from me. Every time. <laughs> Every time he does that, Gemma's there trying to get to sleep. She's got to do a proper job. I'm like, <laughs> it's great. I went to see it live on stage when I was seven. And my mum, my granddad, see the live stage version of a lower low. Full original cat, except for that old bloke who goes, it is I, Le Clegg. So they use like, a different guy every week. One except kept hiring 100 year old actors. But in the last series, there's a bloke of like 19, like made up. So he thought, where are we going wrong with all the it is I, Le Clair guy? Oh, no, let's get a child and make him look old. And this can never happen. Just I just had to keep him like under lock and key in case of accident. But it was quite the old original cast. It's a brilliant show. And if you ever want to see people applauding the Gestapo, then <laughs> go and see Hello, Hello live on stage. Oh, now Flick comes out. It was like, it's so Flick. It's like, he probably does other stuff that isn't featured in the sitcom plots. As a member of the Gestapo, he probably doesn't just do the paint. It's probably what he does to take his mind off the horrors that he's involved. Sort of like, we don't have Flick. I don't want to fucking talk about what I've just been doing. Knock, like, but, 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 knock first, fall on the tonneau with the big boobies and that guy at the cafe. Now, no, so he, he, was he hung for war crimes, Hair Flick, or did he, he took a cyanide pill? Didn't he? Just before Rene got shot for being a collaborator. That's not... I could tell you that's what happens in the last episode of A Low, A Low, because let's face it, no-one else but me <laughs> would sit through all nine series of A Low, A Low to see if that would happen. We had all of that, and I was quite envious of this collection, but the things part, sort of part of me, as it was auctioned off, part of me started to think, once all this is gone, that's kind of it for him, really. There wasn't any... There was, there was, no mention of any kind of family in his in his thing. It was like literally he'd spent his whole life buying all this stuff, accumulating all of it, and it had all just been been sold off. There was like people taking bits. I bought a bit of it. I just did a bit of few impulse buys, things you don't need. No one needs the lobby cards for Cannon and Balls, the boys in blue. They're <laughs> properly ill-advised feature film debut in which they this was ba that's what it was so bad they actually got turned down for their planned role in the Lethal Weapon films and those roles went to Mel Gibson and Danny Glover in the end it was originally written as a cannon and ball vehicle with Bobby Ball in the rigs whatever his name is part that's not actually true I'll admit to making <laughs> I'll admit to making that one up but it's uh, Bobby Ball used to, someone told me allegedly Bobby Ball used to his when he was at the depths of his alcoholism his pulling technique if he saw like a couple that were together and he fancied the wife. He'd walk up to the husband and punch him in the face. And when the husband fought back, the security at the venue would just see Bobby Ball being attacked by someone and go and like bundle the bloke away. And then he'd sort of like sidle up to the wife, go like, you're out there, love. How are you doing? Like, I could finally do this with actual brace. And I hear, right. <laughs> it's the bane of every skinhead modern rude boy wearing brace that someone's going to come up to you and go, hey, rock on, Tommy. I've seen the biggest, scariest skinheads in the world crumble in embarrassment when someone comes up to him, like. Hey, <laughs> pick it well. Whatever, I was always a little and large man myself. But, um, <laughs> really, really was a little. So my hero was Eddie Large when I was a child, my first comedy influence. I used to love that. It's because I, I used to want to be an impressionist. And I was like a proper impression, not like fucking John Coleshaw or that bollocks, but like sort of Gary Wilmot and Les Dennis, that proper impressions for the working man, the sort of Marxist school of impressionism for the, <laughs> for the proletariat. Especially Eddie Lodge, I used to love. He used to do that. He used to, if you've not seen Eddie Lodge, he used to do an ingenious routine about, cele about celebrities. And in this routine, he'd create a fantasy playground in which the celebrity in question had had the car engine 
of their vehicle altered so that it made the noise of whatever vocal tick they were well known for instead of the sound of a motor revving. So it'd be like, you go on, you go, Jimmy Savile starting his car. Ah, I, I think that's fucking funny because Jimmy Savile's exactly the sort of bloke who'd do something like that. That he'd take his car into a garage and go, do you know, goes, well, we've done everything to your car, Mr. Savile. goes, I want it to go, ah, when it starts. I do it now or I'll beat fuck out of you. I wrestle giant haystacks. I'm a testicles kicked up into my stomach. And it's actually true. He admits it himself in a rather bizarre passage in Solomon Garfield's book, The Wrestling, Jimmy Savile talks about having his testicles kicked up into his stomach and having them coaxed back down by a nurse who he later had sex with. <laughs> I could get you the book if you want. You'd have to sit and wait. Get you the book. He says it. He's, you, you read it in his voice. Well, like he's managed to coax my ghoulies down from there. And he doesn't say, I took her to my caravan of love. And <laughs> A caravan, and she said, oh, Can I stay? And I said, No, you fucking can't get out of my ca caravan. I've only ever loved my mother. And I got, You've got to have something that's got to be edited out for legal, re <laughs> for legal reasons, haven't you? And um, yeah, he used to do the, he used to do Barney Rubble starting his car as well. It's another Eddie Large thing. You go, Barney Rubble starting his car. You go, This <laughs> is good, that, because Barney Rubble ain't got an engine in his car. <laughs> Sticks his feet through the bottom, doesn't he? And goes dig, 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 like that. This gives you the BC times, which doesn't explain why they used to have Christmas specials in the Flintstones. But there you go. And there's another. There's another matter. But um, had, had all this bloke had all this stuff in his collection. It was an, a tremendous collection. But I started thinking it's all going to be. And but I sort of bought up the, the boys from the National Lampoon's vacation lobby cars. Thought, yeah, I might as well have that. So I remember that. I used to fancy Beverly D'Angelo. Might as well spend 10 quid on something I don't need because of the memory of someone's tits in a shower. And it's this ball started building. I started thinking, is this where I'm fucking headed? It'll just be me and a bunch of paper and plastic. And then that will be one day I'll snuff it and it will be cleared out and divvied up. It was like watching a dissection. Back in the old days, these iron people for like high women and stuff, and they dissect them as like additional. They don't have Burke and Hare, the body snatchers of Edinburgh. They got, they got a strip club named after them up by, um, in Edinburgh, the, there's what they call the pubic triangle, where it's like three strip clubs facing each other. There's Burke and Hare's, and yeah, it's just, it's just ridiculous. It's like having Sutcliffe's in Bradford, isn't it? It's the most tasteless <laughs> name for a strip club you could possibly think of. But it was like, I could imagine this bloke whose collection it was being shown this by like, the ghost of collector's future, taking him round and going, you see, all of your, your stuff will be... I bought this thing, it was like a, just an album. It was basically his book of bare ladies. It was like postcards to Leslie Ash Topless and Linda Lou Sardi. And if I was 10, that would have been the greatest currency in the playground. <laughs> you could have possibly... I'd have been killed for it, beaten to death with the book, and it would have been taken away and someone else would have it, have it, have it now. And go, ah, Maria Whitaker and the boy in the A-team T-shirt with the Daisy Duke pyjama top over it that I killed for the Maria Whitaker thing. But um, I started to feel a bit kind of morose. And after they'd stopped the auction, all the stuff hadn't been sold, and they were chucking stuff in the skip. They had, they had everything from the film, like I said, from the film Chicken Run. Everything from the film Chicken Run. Everything. Not just like sort of toys and comics that a normal adult male would have, but like sort of duvets, children's shoes, frisbees, alarm clocks, and, and it, was, it, was, it was all getting chucked in the skip. I know, I know the woman who works down there said, Do you want it? I was like, no one fucking wants it. Why did he want it? He must have either thought, he was supposed to have either really liked it or thought it would be a bigger cult success than what it was, but. It all went, and I, I said, that's, that's quite bleak. And she said, I'll show you bleak. So I'll show you something. She said, I know you like your collecting, and that's a lot being around your eggs and seen it. And this is where you're fucking at. And she goes, I'm going to show you something that'll put you off. I thought, well, this I've got to see. And she went out the back, and she come back with this big cardboard box. She puts it down on the table. She goes, have a look in there. And I had a look in there, and it was amazing. It was all in pristine mint condition. Everything this man had was mint. There was posters, vinyl records, collections of bubblegum cards, annuals, gig posters that you wouldn't have ever thought would have been pinned to the side of a building in the pissing rain. It's, at one point in another life, it would have been the world's most valuable collection of Gary Glitter merchandise. <laughs> And I feel for Gary Glitter fans, because let's face it, he's a, the most rightly persona on Grey. He's a fucking scumbag, but he'd done some good songs in his day. You can see it. 
when you're in a pub, when they got like a, you know, when you know, in a, like a pub, and the lineup has got an Oli Pop that his son sort an eighth thing that's got like a million seventies compilations, like he just hits shuffle every year. And it's when, when there's all the glam stuff's so on, there's like the sweet blockbuster and Slade, everyone stomping along, and then you hear like the beginning of Gary Glitter, like now, 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 and they like so I fucking turn that off. But really, everyone's like, I used to love that song. Back in the day, now would be the time to hear it at like two o'clock in the morning, full of cider. Now would be the time to hear Gary Glitter's greatest hits, but you can't do because what the man fucking become. But Jesus, I first got one of the posters that he had was signed, and Gary Glitter had signed it and referenced his hit at the time. It said, "Dear guy from Cal, remember me this way." I thought, "Fucking hell!" There's few moments of poignancy when you're dealing with a scumbag like that, isn't there? <laughs> Very few, but um, that should have stopped me collecting. But it it never. That would have been the Hollywood ending. That would have been the, the ending if I was if I was doing a. That's what it should have been when this was in the Edinburgh show. That should have been the end. And I went back, burnt my collection. I said, "Darling, I've got." I, it's, it's never going to fucking happen. You just either like that, you either like that, you either fit in or you don't. And it's, it's, I thought that's a bit harsh, but I didn't stop collecting anything. Now this just leads me on to. Ask. It's been forty minutes, is it not? It's been 40 minutes. 37. Shall I break or carry on? All right. This next story should take me about 20 minutes, I reckon. <laughs> Can we do that? Is anyone, because I mean, if you need, it's going to be a massive expert. If anyone wants to watch, if, if you're at the back and you needed a piss, it's kind of just like a night, it's become a nightmare scenario that you pay. <laughs> that he paid for the privilege of, hasn't he? <laughs> I was like, I like, I like, one ticket to my worst nightmare here, please. <laughs> anyway, I go to a lot of boot sales as well. It's not just auctions and charity shops. and that. I go to a lot of boot sales. Now, in Edinburgh, there's, I think, the greatest boot sale in the country, and it's in a big multi-storey car park in Edinburgh city centre, and it's, it's horrible down there. Make no mistake about this. It's, it's a, it's a multi-storey car park in a city centre where people like a drink. So it's it's kind of like very humid, very muggy, very smelly. It's like imagine a sauna where you have to pour urine on the rocks <laughs> instead of water. And it's got to give it to make the steam. It's got that this, this sort of horrible fug of effluvia and decadence and pissing all over your own shoes and that. But bargains to be had, it has to be said. <laughs> I went down there with my mate Joe. Joe, he looks, he looks after me. He works for my agent. He looks after me. He's a good guy. He's a stunt man and a cage fighter. And another... You don't do cage... They're always hassling to do cage fighting, but he don't want to do it. He wants to be a wrestler. He's a good fella. But he was down there looking for a belt because he's, he's a guy of my sort of, sort of calibre. He gets through a lot of belts. And he went down there. He, got, he, he bought a suitcase strap with a big combination lock on it at the boot sale. And he goes, I'm going to wear this as a belt. And I said, so what good can possibly come <laughs> of having to memorise a combination of numbers in order to open your trousers? <laughs> I said, you're going to, either going to piss yourself, shit yourself, or have one of the most frustrating sexual experiences that anyone's ever had in their life. But it was, it was, a, good wear, it was a good wearing belt. He just set it to zero, zero, zero. Zero, I think. But anyway, while he was buying this, I was having a look round. Like, I got some good deal. I got 10 get along gang figurines for 50 pence. Yeah, he's stunned to incredulity. <laughs> there, he's, he's a good deal. I said to him, Do you not want more money for that? And he goes, Not really. He goes, What are you going to do with them then? He goes, You're going to line them up and shoot them with an air pistol. I, I said, An air pistol? I said, I've not got an air pistol. So I'm a grown man, you twat. <laughs> And I went on to the next stall, and it was one of those... Some people have stalls that don't belong at a boot sale. It's either, like, the proceeds of a robbery. Like they'll be selling, like, white goods or something like that, and, like, sort of 100 lighters for a pound with blood all over them and, <laughs> and all of that. But, or, or, like, antiques and stuff. You don't go to a boot sale to buy the fucking Mona Lisa, do you? But people insist on bringing junk and antiques. There was this stall. It was all sort of junk. Joe was looking for his belt, and I was, I was, I'd look through, and it was all... A lot of war medals, really old war medals. I thought, that's... 
come to something. You get your brains blown out in the Crimean War. And then, like, hundreds of years down the line, some indie kid walks up to a boot sale store, buys the medal they sent to your wife, then pins it on his lapel as a wanky little accessory and goes to see some fucking awful rock band. And goes, oh, fucking check the irony of this. Don't bear thinking about it. But in amongst all of this was a flintlock pistol and it sort of like jumped out with me a bit now you know what a flintlock pistol is even if you don't know what it is you would if i was to pull one out and in here now it's, it's it's basically the gun that pirates use pirates adam and adam and used to wave one around like stand and deliver <laughs> he's still fuck I, me and adam could have been best mates in a previous life i reckon <laughs> He could have been. He looks more like me now. He's kind of chubby and wears Spice Girls t-shirts now. He could be <laughs> great, mate. He'd probably think I was a fucking idiot. But um, it's, it's a flintlock. It's a pot. It's good. See, the thing is, right, it's, they're really nice-looking flintlocks. They're nice-looking guns. Now, guns aren't nice. They're, the weapons are for... Unless you're actually in an armed conflict, you might as well... If you're just like, carrying a gun on the street, you might as well have a tattoo that goes with it saying, I can't fight with my hands and I'm basically a fucking coward that goes on your forehead that's not sort of done while they're sorting out your paperwork. But the thing with a flintlock, the thing with anything that's really old, something that's violent but old, through the passage of time and through the making of films and cartoons and comics and that, it kind of loses its bite. But pirates, bunch of floating rapists, essentially, but they had very good PR. <laughs> seen as jovial figures now, swashbucklers and, and all of that, advertising pasties and that. People go, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like Blackbeard apart if he fucking walked in here. He'd kill every single one, one of us and think fucking nothing of it. But they parts the Caribbean, the West Cornwall Pasty Company and all of that, Captain Pugwash. A highwayman, essentially, is, is fucking carjacking, but using a horse. It's probably easier. To, it must have been easier back then, actually. Right? You don't have to hot water a horse. Just get on it and... <laughs> It's it, same as, everyone, same, same as everyone else. It's, if, I, if I was a different kind of comedian, I could have called it horse jacking. And then I'd get some weekend club gigs then. I'd go, <laughs> find up a weekend club and I'd go, hello, so you here before? And he banged on about care bears. And he went, so I, go, well, I, got, I, got, so I said, um, what I'm going to say horse jacking um, to refer to car jacking on horseback. But the audience will think I'm talking about masturbating you know, a horse. So they'll be they're like, oh, well, come, we'll give, you, we'll give you a weekend down here. Come down here. You're not allowed to eat the buffet because it's your first time. Uh, yep, stand there. The corn is just going to go on and shout about penises for 40 minutes before he brings you on. Before he brings you on. He's down there. He's like, you're right, ladies and gentlemen. Fucking penis, penis. Fucking penis slag. Fucking chaff. Neto, neto. Fucking penis. I'm fucking, where are you from? That's fucking shit. What's your story, big man? Penis, penis, penis! And now, the Care Bear-related monologues <laughs> of Will Hudson. So I went in Manchester one weekend thing once. There was a guy sat down the front. He looked like fucking Jabba the Hutt in a Hawaiian shirt with sobs on every finger and a big thing of scampi, like the size of a child's paddling pool. And I got... <laughs> I got right to the end. I got about to go down ah, the crux. He goes, will you get to the point, you fucking cockney bastard? I thought, I thought it's just all right. If I said to him, like, you've, well, you're a mank bastard, he'd go, I'm from fucking Salford, you ignorant twat. Fucking get it right. Where was I saying? Yeah, the flit, the flit. I mean, this, this is... <laughs> Pirates, Highwomen, Bonnie and Clyde, cold-blooded killers, make a film with Faye Dunaway. And you got, this is why in 100 years' time, there will be an animated Disney movie in which Raoul Moat is played by an animated fox. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about that. I mean, Disney's Raoul Moat, and there'll be like the arm response unit will be played by Badgers, and there'll be <laughs> Paul Gascoigne will be like an albino ferret or something like that. <laughs> I loved how Noah was surprised he was mates with Gascoigne at the time. He just got, they were sort of like, I'm friends with this. And I was sort of like, what? Sportsman Paul Gascoigne, friends with an armed maniac. I was sort of like, yeah, fucking sounds about right to me. <laughs> Chicken and fishing and all that. I think Ray could have fucking come round of mine instead if he was, he was, he was turned back there. It sounds, was he going to fish with the fried chick? He fucking must have been. <laughs> so, and it, well, this is the thing, was because the, the bloke who stole it was seeing me looking at this flintlock and thinking all of this. And he comes up and he goes, you're going to buy the flintlock? And I was like, well, no, because I don't like guns. They're horrible things. Tragedies waiting to happen in your sock drawer. But I thought, it is a classier tragedy waiting to happen, it has to be said. 
I said, I bet this is massively expensive. And he said, well, you'd think so. He said, let's have a look at this. He said, well, to be honest, that's a very common model. I'd sell you that for 10 quid. I thought, 10 quid? For a gun? I thought, could I buy a gun at a car boot sale and get it back to Chippenham from Edinburgh, which involves getting on a plane and... <laughs> What's the deal when you got when you got when you because when you get to the front and they go like have you got any nail clippers or a toy? I got I've got a fucking gun in me <laughs> and luggage. It's, it's a it's a really old one. I don't even know what will come out of it when the plane goes into turbulence. It gets batted about in the baggage compartment. That little plane, big cannonball, comes out of the <laughs> baggage drinks. For the I don't know. I've been in shit with the armed response unit myself. Do you know what I mean? I'm not years ago. I wasn't doing anything particularly criminal, but it was. Um, I was doing film studies in 1994. Um, Ian, you were, th- you were in the yeah. year below me. It was the, um, you were always lit up when I said I've been in shit with the armed response unit because you, <laughs> you recall the time when... Yeah. Well, this was my first appearance in the paper. I was too young to be legally named. Basically, <laughs> in 1994... It was easy to be a film study student. All he did was make heist movies all the time. He's supposed to be learning about, like, Ken Loach or Melier or the Lumiere brothers and all that. He just watched loads of Tarantino in 1994 and he'd walk around making heist movies and pasties. He spent a year walking around in a black suit calling people a motherfucker while someone points a camera at you. And one of the difficult things, though, is workable replica guns. Because mostly you're relying on, like, bananas and your own fingers extended to look like a gun. But we got hold of a starter's pistol one day. <coughs> First cough, I got a terrible cough. And I thought, it's taken me 50 minutes to cough. Got a starter's pistol. We got a bit of drain pipe with another bit of drain pipe on the end of it. <coughs> I'm going to cough my guts up, I think. Um, can we break and restart? Well, I've coughed a lot. Is that all right? Because I'm going to either going to cough and splutter everywhere. <coughs> I'll return with. Uh, I wish I could do this in clubs because I'd never, never happen on a Friday. <laughs> Down in a hail of chicken wings and scampi and potato <laughs> wedges, going, "Hey, you fucking get to the point, you fucking ginger bearded bastard." <coughs> Let's, should we take a break here, Chris, and I'll come back with why I got in shit with the armed response unit. It's like a cliffhanger. Like, <laughs> why I was in shit with the armed response unit. <laughs>